Open our Bibles to Acts chapter 7, please. Acts chapter 7, and if you don't know and you're here visit, visiting, uh, welcome. <laughs> My mouth is not working today, so this should be fun here. Uh, when Sunday mornings we go chap verse by verse through a book of the Bible. Wednesday nights we go, uh, we're going chapter by chapter through the whole Bible. We're probably about, uh, I don't know if two-thirds of the way through, but uh, we're probably at least 60% total of the way through. Uh, and tonight we come to Acts chapter 7. Let's go ahead and pray as we're coming into God's word once again. Lord, as we open your word once again tonight, we ask that your Holy Spirit would soften our hearts, Lord that we would hear from you afresh, Lord, by your word, which is living, Lord. Would you anoint each one of us here, those that are watching or listening, Lord, and help us to learn and grow tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we come into chapter 7, we remember that Stephen, uh, one of the fellows who had been selected uh, to wait on table so that the uh, apostles could prioritize um, the teaching of the studying of God's word and prayer. Uh, and Stephen, basically a deacon, he has been arrested at this point uh, and is now standing before the Jewish Sanhedrin, uh, which is which would be the 71 leaders of Israel. Uh, in verse one, it says, then the high priest said, are these things so? Uh, what things? Well, back in chapter six, we saw uh, that the Lord was using Stephen, uh, we're told uh, in verse uh, 8 of Acts chapter 6 uh, that Stephen was full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. Uh, so here is Stephen. He's been arrested for doing nothing more than, uh, you know, doing these signs and wonders among the people. Um, but we also went on to study last week that you remember uh, some Jews arose from a synagogue of what's called the Freemen, uh, and they disputed with Stephen. Uh, but we're also told that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. The Lord anointed uh, Stephen as he was speaking to these fellows and so these godly fellows uh, from a synagogue there went on to get others to lie about Stephen. Uh, and so then they arrested him and brought him before the council again, uh, the 71 seated Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and as we left off last time, if you remember, or even just want to glance at the end of chapter 6, uh, in verse 15, uh, it says, And all who sat in the council, uh, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Uh, and that's how Peter, or excuse me, Stephen is looking at these fellows who are obviously looking at least at this point very intently at him. These accusations now leveled. Uh, and so the chief priest says, hey, are these things so? And now Stephen is supposed to be addressing these false accusations against him. Uh, now that he's been given the opportunity to speak, um, but it's interesting to know what he does instead. He starts to witness to them. And uh, I love this. So my heart tonight is, as we go through this, uh, I believe uh, that it's something very important for all of us here tonight. Uh, notice that this is the longest recorded message in the book of Acts. Luke, uh, by the Holy Spirit, saw something that was very important in this. He knew that this was important even for us here today. And I believe that as we go through this, what Stephen is doing, even though he's witnessing uh, to these Jewish elders, and he brings up mostly their uh, Jewish past, actually all of it, um, it's still a great teacher for us today on how to witness to people. How to witness. Now, look at verse 2 as he begins. Now, I don't know about you, but if I got brought before a judge here and said, hey, you know, these are the, the, the charges against you, I might say, oh, well, he's lying, she's lying, they're lying, they're all lying against me. And, you know, I get, get all upset. Uh, but not Stephen. He just, look at he, where he goes with this in verse 2. And he said, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Now, what's interesting to note here is he first addresses these leaders. 
uh, even though uh, you know the main leadership had been installed by Rome and were under Roman uh, guidance, uh, uh, and most of the guys here weren't godly at all, he still treats them with respect due servants of God. Notice, hey, brethren and fathers. Um, and then secondly, we notice that now Stephen goes all the way back to their father Abraham. Uh, when the glory of the Lord appeared to him. And so he basically is reminding them that God chose them, that the God of glory appeared to Abraham. It wasn't that Abraham was out there seeking the God of glory. No, God selected Abraham and he would create his own people, uh, the Jewish race out of uh, coming out of Abraham. And so God, taking the initiative from the beginning, verse 3, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and went and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land which now you dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in him, in it, not even enough to set his foot on. So again, Stephen is now basically given these Jewish leaders uh, a, a history of their own, uh, you know, basically a history of their own history, if you will. Uh, biblically, what had happened, how they came to be. Uh, he points out that God brought Abraham here to the promised land that they were now in, yet Abraham didn't, he didn't receive that promise. It was a promise to him and his descendants to have that land, and yet Abraham had no inheritance in it. Notice, not even enough to set his foot on. But we also must note something here in verses 3 and 4, uh, that God told him to do something and he did it. God told him to do something and he did it. And that's going to come out a little bit later as to why that is so important. Look at verse 5 as it continues. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and his descendants after him, talking about the land. And again, we could go off and talk about the land today. Whose land is it there that Israel? They are not occupiers. Uh, that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. If you believe that lie, you need to go back to the Bible. And we see even now, uh, 2,000 years ago, before there was anything called Islam, uh, that they're reminded of even thousands of years before this, when God gave them the land as a possession and to his descendants, after him look at verse 6 but god spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them in, into bondage and oppress them for 400 years and the nation to whom they would be in bondage i will judge said god and after they shall come out and serve me in this place so it's an interesting thing uh, if you've ever paid attention to how uh, the, the Jewish way of writing, for the most part, uh, they'll do a lot of where they'll make a statement or two, uh, and then you kind of think they're moving on, but they don't. They actually go in the next portion, and they go on, and they explain the statement they just made. They, do, they go further in depth. And so that's what uh, Stephen is doing here at the end of verses 5, 6, and 7. He's kind of given a synopsis about uh, their, their captivity in Egypt, that God would judge them and bring them out of this place. Um, so again, Stephen given this brief outline, and now he's going to go in depth, if you will, in verse 8. Look at verse 8 with me. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. So once again, uh, here we see Stephen reminding these Jewish leaders of the sign of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. Look, Abraham, you need to circumcise your sons on the eighth day. Uh, this will be a sign of the covenant that we had. And so, again, we notice in verse 8, what does Abraham do? He has his son Isaac, and he has him circumcised on the eighth day. Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begot uh, the twelve patriarchs. Uh, and so, again, we're noticed that we have Abraham's once again obedient response to the Lord. Uh, and then we see we, now the patriarchs are the 12 heads, if you will, the, uh, the 12 that would give birth to the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. 
Verse 9 continues, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Ah, so now we come. Check this out. Just here at the very beginning, uh, just the third generation in, if you will. You could even say the second. But let's say the third generation in, uh, we see sin entering into the picture. And there's actually sin earlier, but specifically of this sort, which we're looking at. Notice the patriarchs, the founders of the tribes of Israel, the first of those became envious of Joseph, uh, one of their brothers. And so they got so envious. Uh, and remember, sin is envy is a sin. And so as, as they're sinning here, then it led them to more sinful acts uh, as the act of selling their own brother into slavery into Egypt. Now, remember, I, and I love this, that the God of the covenant never broke his promise. Because notice what he says here, but God was with him. Hey, can I just say a little side note? No matter what anyone else does to you, uh, many of us here have been hurt by others, and, and, and if you haven't, you will be. Uh, and by the way, most of us here, actually all of us here have hurt others as well. Um, but here's the beautiful thing. Notice here that God was with him. And so too, Jesus told us uh, in the book of Hebrews that he would never leave us nor forsake us. God never leaves us alone. If we are uh, in his, you know, born again into the family of God, we are now family uh, and God is always with us. And so God doesn't break his promises, but God was always with him. You know, we sang this song tonight, uh, Give Me Jesus. Uh, and that's by Fernando Ortega. I think it's kind of a loose uh, translator, you know, loosely taken from a, a hymn that Fanny Crosby wrote. Uh, and, and I'm just going to read a portion of it. She said this, Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abideth ever through eternal years the same. Oh, the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love, oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. Take the world, but give me Jesus. And so even here, even as we're, we're seeing here that, uh, you know, the patriarchs, they became envious and sold Jesus into Egypt, or excuse me, Joseph into Egypt, God was still with him. You know, you can have the whole world. And just remember that even if everything is taken from you, even your life, God will always be with you. I don't know about you, but man, that, that should bring us great comfort even here tonight in seeing this. Now look at verse 10. So they delivered him out of all his troubles, God did, and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. So again, even in the midst of their sins, God's will was still accomplished. You know, we need to remember Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 11 tells us at the end, it says, uh, him who works all things according to the counsel of of his will. God is completely sovereign. God is in complete control at all times, even though we have free will. Uh, in the midst of that, God works everything to his perfect will. Uh, and that's just what the Bible teaches us. Uh, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And he's kind of pointing back here, Stephen. Uh, to Joseph and how God worked it all together for good. His brother said, hey, let's throw him in a hole. Let's kill him. And oh, well, hey, there's some slave traders over. Let's sell them there. And, and he goes, you know, sells into Egypt. And he uh, becomes the, the you know, slave of a guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife lies about him. And he gets thrown in prison. But in the midst of that, God was with him and used it. I just love how what verse you know, 10 says, look, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter what anybody else does. God well, your, God's favor will continually be upon those who are his. And so I love this. But again, he's pointing out, look, this is what God did anyway. Now look at verse 11, because it kind of points out, Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. 
And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh, then Joseph sent and called for his fa- or called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt. Then he died, and our, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb at, of that Abraham, bought for the sum of money from the sons of Hamor, or Hamar, uh, the father of Shechem. Uh, and so again, you, you might be sitting there, what does this have to do with today? Why is he going over all this, Stephen, uh, before the Sanhedrin? Let's keep going. It, it all comes together. Look at verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Remember earlier uh, that God had said, told Abraham, look, your people will go into captivity for 400 years. I will punish that land, uh, but they, this will happen. And so now this is what's happening here. When the time of God's promise drew near, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Verse 18, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. He didn't remember how God had used Joseph to bless Egypt and all the world, by the way. Verse 19, this man dealt treacherously with our people and opposed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so they may not live. Uh, The New Living says, forcing parents to abandon their newborn babies so they would die. Uh, They didn't want the Jewish people to continue to grow and thrive under them. So uh, they started having them do that. They had, you know, uh, midwives killing babies. It was it was just so wicked. Now look at verse 20. At this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. Now notice that Moses was well pleasing to God. Verse 21. But when he set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up for her own, as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, now imagine this, 40 years old is how old he was. Uh, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Verse 24. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Anybody starting to see the story that Stephen is pointing out to the Sanhedrin? Do you you remember? What did they do with Joseph? They rejected Joseph, didn't they? God's chosen. What did they do with Moses when he first came? He thought, no, in verse 25, he supposed the brethren uh, understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they didn't understand. Look at verse 26. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting. Two, Jew, two Jews were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler, a ruler and a judge over us? Did you want to kill me as you killed the Egypt as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. So notice this is the second major rejection of their forefathers. Again, first they rejected Joseph, who went was later on. What did he do? He became, God used him to save them. He, he used them to save, you know, basically the known world at that time uh, because of the drought that had come. Uh, and so they rejected Joseph. And now here within our text, the people of Israel rejected Moses. Why did God send Moses to them? To save them from Egypt, to take them out of the land. Anybody see a correlation here between all these and Jesus? Hello? You guys killed the Messiah. It's coming up. You, you, you killed the other ones that came to save you too. And you killed the Messiah. So he's kind of, he's going, look, you know, basically, look, one plus one equals two. And, and showing him all these things. Now, what's interesting to me, I just want to take a side note, if you will. Just, just side note for, away from our study for just a moment. You know, there are so many today... Uh, who think themselves to be Bible scholars and teacher, Bible teachers, uh, pastors even, uh, who say that the Old Testament is wooden. 
uh, that basically we should ignore the Old Testament. I've heard guys say this. I, if I said their names, you'd know them. Um, and they, you know, basically say that uh, it, it's not worth it because the God of the or the people of the Old Testament, the Jews, didn't really know God. Uh, they didn't really know about Him. Uh, and yet, it's so worth noting here uh, that within our text we see clearly that the New Testament Church used the Old Testament to witness. Uh, to call people to repentance in Jesus Christ. Uh, so be careful what you buy into. Hey, can some of the Old Testament be rough to read and get through? Uh, some of the historical stuff, I find it very fascinating myself, but numbers, let's say, and some other things. But, but when you start, you get a good commentary. Uh, you get a good study Bible and you start to understand, hey, this ties and points forward to Hebrews and Hebrews points back to Matthew. Matthew points forward to Revelation. Revelation points back to Deuteronomy. It's just beautiful to see. And so basically, uh, don't give up on any part of the Bible. The whole Bible, every jot, every tittle, uh, at which every comma and period uh, is breathed out by God. All these 66 books, Old Testament, New Testament, that we call the Bible, this is all the Word of God. Amen. We need to remember this. And it is and with that, it is perfect. It is infallible without mistake in the original languages. And it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And so even the Old Testament. So again, we're showing this, you know, that, that's what Stephen's witnessing with. Look at verse 30 in our text. And when 40 years had passed, he's continuing, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Now think about this. Because they rejected Moses the first time, they went back into 40 more years of hard labor uh, there in Egypt. And now, uh, here's Moses, and you know he's, uh, there's a flame in the bush uh, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Verse 31, when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight as he drew near to observe. The voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dare not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I love this picture. I don't know about you, but I've always, even when you go back and you studied in the Old Testament, just a, hey, this is holy ground. Take your sandals off, man. Hey, this is holy ground. Kind of funny, isn't it? Today, uh, when people come into quote unquote holy places, what do we say? Take, put your shoes on. You ever notice that? Here he's saying, take your sandals off. This is holy ground. Uh, look at verse 34. I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Now look at verse 35. He points it out to him, right? This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Who else showed signs and wonders when he came? Anybody? Jesus. He was persecuted by the religious leaders for, well, you can't heal on a Sabbath day. And even though he'd done all these signs and wonders, God had sent him. This is what Stephen is saying. Look, this isn't the first time. Look at, look at our own history. So Stephen here is trying to help them connect the dots. Look at verse 37. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Who is he talking about here? Amen. Moses even prophesied about Jesus coming. It's like, hey, hello, Mr. Mr. All Set Henry, you 71 people are supposed to be the most, the smartest guys on the planet uh, as far as the Lord. You, you missed it. Moses, he said, look, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. 
So again, Stephen is pointing to Jesus. Verse 38, this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give us, whom our fathers would not obey, but what does it say? But rejected. So not only do the fathers have this continual history of rejecting the ones that God sent. But now he points, look, they even rejected his word. As, he was, as Moses was given the word of God, they, were re, they rejected, they did not obey it. Uh, and so notice, and in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. So the people of Egypt would have rather gone back into slavery than to follow Moses. And in reality, they weren't rejecting Moses. They're rejecting God. And, and that's really the key, isn't it? They wanted to go back to the world. They wanted to, to go back and, you know, live in their chains. And, and, and that's what sin does to us even today. So many caught up uh, in, in the chains of their sin. And when they get the opportunity to be freed, they don't take it. They'd rather just walk in their sins. Man, I remember years ago, that was me. That was me living that life of, you know, drinking and, and drugs and chasing after girls and sinning. That, that was my life. And, and it was a thing that I could not escape from, a darkness that I could not escape from. But I was set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, 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 and I did reject it for a time. But man, the Lord kept knocking at that door. The Lord kept calling to me. And here we see. Uh, these people of Israel, they turned their hearts. They, they, they were back to Egypt, back to the world. Verse 40, uh, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And what do the people of Israel even today say? Oh, we don't know what became of this Jesus guy. Well, you know, what do we care? I think a lot of this is pointing, even if you look at the biblical history uh, and what Stephen is pointing out to this time right now, even still today. God is not finished with the nation of Israel. We see that very clearly when Israel became a nation again, May 14th, 1948. Never happened in the history of the world. And we see God doing this. It's beautiful. But again, uh, here they are. Just, they're just rejecting uh, the one that God had sent. Look at verse 41. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. This sounds like a lot who profess to be Christians today, doesn't it, too? Have you guys seen the, this, the similarity to that? So many who profess to love Jesus, and yet they'd rather go back to the ways of the world. Oh, they'll still say they're a Christian, uh, and yet they're, they're rejoicing. Notice verse 41, they rejoice in the work of their own hands, not in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. Look at verse 42. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Remphan, images which you made to, which you made to worship. And I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. Now he's talking about the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, the tabernacle uh, that they would come and, and lift up their offerings to the Lord at, and uh, that they, they could it would it was temporary. It was like a tent of meeting, if you will. They would set it up and tear it down as they moved. Set it up and tear it down. Uh, and so again, as Joshua possessed the land by the Gentiles, notice in verse forty-five, just briefly, notice who drove out uh, the Gentiles. It was God. Notice it says, whom God drove out before the faces of our fathers until the days of David, because that was God's land to give to the people of Israel. Verse 46, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. So David found favor in the eyes of the Lord and said, hey, Lord, I want to build your house. He said, sorry, bro, 
You've got too much blood on your hands, and no, you can't do that. And, but Solomon came and built the house, verse 47. Verse 48, however, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what uh, is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? And so the Lord is saying, look, you know, again, they failed once again. The, the, temp, the tabernacle in the temporary, uh, in the wilderness was temporary. The temple that David wanted to build and Solomon did build was temporary. It ended up being destroyed. Remember, God does not dwell in temples made with human hands. He's saying, look, God is a lot bigger than, than you see here. And so once again, the people of Israel, notice, wanted to put God in a box. In other words, they wanted to build another temple. Uh, kind of this is what the Sanhedrin is doing now that Stephen is addressing them. Look, let's build a temple. We'll keep God in that box. And, and, and so that's where he dwells. And then we're going to go out and do whatever we want d during the day and night. And, and certain times we'll give to him. But he, we want him to stay right there in that box. There's a lot of people that do the same thing with church today, don't we? In other words, look, you know what? That's God's. If I go to church, that's his place. You know, I'll give him his due for that hour or two a week. And that's it, you know. But the rest of the time's mine, bro. And I'm going to go do what I want to do. And that's kind of what he's saying here. Because uh, sadly, they didn't want anything to do with God. They didn't want to obey him. They didn't, walk into the, they didn't want to walk in the covenant or the laws of God. And so they continually rejected God in this manner. By the way, that's why they are where they are. They're in occupied uh, Roman territory right now. Their home has been occupied by Rome. Uh, all of, uh, you know, Israel. Uh, and by the way, that's where pa the name Palestine came. I think it was around 130, 80, 135. It was renamed that because uh, Rome didn't want them to have a place to live anymore. Uh, and so a very interesting but wicked thing. But again, if I may, the application here is quite glaring. If we say that we're Christians and that we love God, and yet we continually reject him through his word and continually, uh, you know, reject his commands. We need to be warned tonight that we're having the same hearts as the people of Israel. Those hardened hearts, those ones that say, hey, I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I'm a Christian. I gave my life when I was 12 years old to Jesus. I don't need to read my Bible and, and obey what I say there. That's a heart of rebellion, guys and gals. We need to remember this. You see, the heart that loves Jesus has been born again is going to say, I want to obey everything in there. I know I'm going to blow it, Lord, every day. But man, I'm going to get up by the power of your spirit and walk it in love to you. That's loving obedience. But again, it's, it's so sad because so many of us may be even here tonight. You think that you're okay because you said a prayer one time and yet you don't care if you're walking in, by love and the commandments of God. It's a very sad thing. Um, and, and I pray that people are warned here, whether you're watching or listening or here, uh, you know, because, you know, as we see, look at the end uh, to what the state of this false uh, profession and belief is. Look at verse 51. This is what Stephen goes on to say. You stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Anybody here witnessed anybody lately like this? Oh, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You know, it's interesting because today, again, there's a sad thing within the church of not really telling people the truth. We think it's more loving to tell them things that sound good and say, hey, you know what? It doesn't really matter if you love Jesus or not. You know, there's no real hell. There's no real sin. You know, all the people of the world, you know, they all worship the same God. It's the Muslims and the Jews and the Buddhists and the Christians. Everybody worships the same God. And yet those are all lies straight from the pit of hell. Those are all lies. You see, here at least Stephen's being honest, Right. How many people like it when people are honest with us? A lot of people, we don't want to hear the truth today. Isn't that our culture? Isn't that the whole woke culture today? Don't tell me the truth. I don't care about the truth. I've heard, I remember seeing this video with some gal. I don't, it's, it's not the truth that matters. It's our feelings that matter. 
And the guy's like, well, let me tell you the truth. I don't care about the truth. It's like, well, so it's, and then, but nobody ever even takes that to its natural conclusion. So we should all just live by our feelings then. Yes. Well, I feel like I want to steal your money right now. Is that okay with you? Well, no, it doesn't matter. Then I look at them and say, it doesn't matter because that's how I feel. I'm going to live by my feelings. Sincerely, it, it's absurd. It's better to be honest with someone and hopefully and prayerfully the Holy Spirit uh, work on them and, and their way into heaven than to love somebody into hell. Look at this. Hey, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard ears. I hate to say it, but I think some are here tonight. That this is you. You are stiff-necked and you're uncircumcised in heart. You're religious here tonight. You, you, you come and you say the right things. Or maybe you're at home, sitting at home, and you're hearing this. You say the right things, but you've never been born again of the Spirit of God. There's a hardness in your hearts. You're religious when you come to church, but man, Katie, bar the door when you get outside and you go home. Hey, Dad, what happened to that guy I saw at church? What are you talking about? Mom, what happened to that gal I saw at church? What are you talking about? Son, what happened to the guy we saw at church? What are you talking about, Mom and Dad? There's a problem there if, if that's how you live. If you're living a double life or a triple life or a quadruple life. You come here and you act a certain way. Oh, praise God, hallelujah, praise Jesus. Oh, brother, so and so, sister, so God bless you, babe. And then you get in the car and you're cursing like a sailor and yelling and screaming and outbursts of wrath, and you think that's all okay. It's not okay. You're probably stick, stiff necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears. You become so religious. You've heard Pastor Bill tell you this so many times, or other pastors, you just ignore it. Oh, he's a nut job. He, he's a wacko. And yet nobody ever comes to me, by the way, that, that'll say that about me and shows me and show me where I'm wrong in the Bible. Not once. And not that I'm always right or always perfect. I'm not saying that, but God's word is. And, and, and so, you know, be careful is what I'm saying. You always resist the Holy Spirit. How many of us tonight here are resisting the Holy Spirit of God? You know, we have, we profess this faith in Jesus, but we lack the power thereof. Be careful, man. Be careful. You resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. So do you. And sometimes notice it can come from our parents or our grandparents. Well, my parents are religious. They were never really filled with the Spirit of God, never really loved the Lord too much. They kind of, I think they may have. They kind of brought us to church, but they were never really on fire for Jesus. And so, look, we're just like our mom and dad. How is your mom and dad? Are they on fire for Jesus Christ? Look, if they're not, pray for them, but don't let that affect your relationship with Jesus. Get on fire for Jesus, man. I remember when I got saved, sitting on my surfboard, I came home, man, and I'm just all excited about Jesus. And my mom and dad, they took us to church every Sunday. I went to religious schools. I was part of, and when, when I came home, even then, they're just like, oh, what are you doing? Get, get away from what, what's going on. What, what happened to you? I, I don't know what happened, man. I just, I, I prayed and the Lord did these mighty things and, and I now have a relationship with Jesus. I've been born again, and I didn't even know what, what I didn't even know how to describe that. But my mom and dad, they continually kind of push back, and you know, well, you just need to be religious. It's like, no, you need to be in a relationship. And I, you know, I, I it was a sad thing to me that that I couldn't go to mom and dad and say, hey, look, man, this is what an on fire, spirit filled relationship with Jesus is. And they would just kind of, I don't want to see it because they're comfortable. Who who isn't comfortable, right? We just like to be comfortable. You know, don't shake my boat, buddy. And yet we need our boat being shaken sometimes. Amen? Hey, all of us do. Don't, don't take this. I'm pastor. I, my boat was already shaken when I was studying all this stuff. Man, the Lord's going, ooh, shake it up, Bill. Now, Stephen was talking to these Jewish leaders, but again, I believe it may, may apply to some of us here tonight, some watching or listening. Look at verse 52 back in our text. He drives it all home. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law is delivered by angels and did not keep it. Do you notice how he's not sitting there going, you know, you guys really need to understand Jesus loves you. God's grace is 
It's sufficient for you. God's mercy, God's kindness. No, what is he doing? He is pointing to their sin. Wait a minute, that's not how we're supposed to witness. Yes, it is. Notice here, he's pointing them right to their sins. Hey, which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? They killed all those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one and whom you, he's pointing, you have now now betrayed and murdered. You betrayed the righteous one. You betrayed the anointed one that was to come, the Christ, the Messiah. And notice even in verse 53, you who received the law is delivered by angels and did not even keep it. Notice here with Stephen, they were breaking their own laws and bringing him before trial because they were bearing false witness. They did the same thing with Jesus. They bore false witness against him. They struck him when he didn't deserve to be struck. They did all these things, not keeping with their own law. So Stephen is now pointing out their sin, pointing out their guilt. Why is he doing that? He's doing that so they see their need for repentance. He's doing that so they see their need to turn away from their sin and turn to Jesus Christ and find forgiveness at the cross of Jesus Christ. And, and that's what he was doing. He, remember, he, he started, he has the face of an angel and he's just driving it home. The Bible says that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. And so we need before, I believe firmly that before we can truly get saved, we need to feel the weight of our sin. Because that's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit, by the way, came to do, isn't it? That he comes alongside the unbeliever to convict the unbeliever of what? Of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then in that holy conviction, it's not just, hey, come to Jesus. Hey, have a come to Jesus moment. It's feeling that conviction of our sin. And then turning away from that sin because we have a godly sorrow, the Bible calls it, where we mourn enough, I don't want it. And so we change our mind about our sin. I don't want to love my sin anymore. I don't want to stay in my sin. I want to believe in Jesus Christ. I want to find forgiveness and be set free from my sin for all eternity. And so we turn from our sin that's called repentance and we turn to Jesus Christ. And we find new life there. We believe that he died for our sins. We believe that Jesus was risen from the dead on the third day. We believe in him to be the Lord and the Savior of our lives and we're then born again of the Spirit of God. Notice, they're not calling him to join any church, to go to a catechism or, hey, go to this class. No, 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 he's pointing them to their sin in hopes that they would repent. Now, if you remember back in Acts chapter 2, Peter did about the same thing, almost the same history, just a lot briefer, if you will, um, and he, he basically preached to uh, the people who came to hear them in Jerusalem. These thousands upon thousands of people heard them. And, and, and Peter preached, you know, roughly the same message, very similar to what we see Stephen preaching here. Now, let's compare the results of these two messages, shall we? So notice verse 54. First, the religious leaders here in verse 54 in our text. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now stop there for just a moment. Well, they heard these things just like uh, back in Acts chapter 2, the people of Israel uh, there in Jerusalem heard these things. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 37, you don't have to turn there, but it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Hey, it's the same thing. They both heard about their sin. They both heard that they, you know, had killed the Messiah. But look at the difference on the the reaction to this cutting to the heart. Notice in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now what happened in the other, uh, in, in Acts 2.37, it says, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men, brethren, what shall we do? Do you notice you have one heart that is so hardened against God that they're just gnashing their teeth at, at Stephen. And this other, man, they were cut to the heart and it's like, dude, what do we do? As they cry out to the apostles. That's what happens when you give the gospel. There is no middle ground. 
If you are here tonight, if you're watching or listening, and you've heard the gospel many times, you're religious, or you just never made a decision to, to turn away from your sins, to repent, there's no middle ground. The, the religious aren't going to heaven. We need to understand this. Only those who have been born again into the kingdom of God. And that starts with repentance and it ends with receiving new life and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. That's the beautiful thing. But don't think that you can be in the middle. Don't think that you can have fire insurance. So they were cut to the heart. Uh, and I love this because the one group gets to hear the answer. Hey, what shall we do? The other were so hard-hearted and gnashing teeth. They don't want to hear how to get saved. But this is what Peter told the group there in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. But let's see what the other group has. Look at verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, now this is Stephen again, gazed into heaven. So these men are all gnashing their teeth at him, and as they're doing this, Stephen gazes into heaven, and he saw the glory of God. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. You might want to underline that and highlight that in your Bibles. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Verse 26, and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, what's so awesome about this? First of all, then he got to see into heaven. Amen. I mean, imagine looking up. Like, there's Jesus. There's Jesus. But notice something here that we... We could so easily pass up. Notice, this is such a beautiful thing. Jesus is now standing at the right hand of God. Why does that matter? You don't have to turn there again just because of time, but Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said to him, it is, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of, the fa of power. Ephesians 1, 20, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And then in Colossians 3.1, Colossians 3.1. Then, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus now stands. Why? Because this is his first martyr. And he's welcoming him, him home. I get teary-eyed, I get excited, I get blessed. This is the first martyr of the church, and Jesus is standing. But notice the reaction, verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice. They act like little kids, you notice this? They stand and cry out, oh, no, 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 no. stop their ears. <laughs> Everyone ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, and they stoned Stephen. As he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Such a beautiful picture, uh, you know, as they are stoning uh, Stephen to death. But the reason it's beautiful to me is because notice he's not cursing at them. He's not, you know, God will get you, <laughs> he buzzards, you know. But he's, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He's focused on the Lord. We were talking about this on Sunday. How do we endure today? We keep focused on Jesus, right? And, and so he was, he kept focused on Jesus. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Oh, the great mercy, grace, and love of our God. To allow Stephen the great honor, not only of seeing himself, but seeing himself standing for Stephen at the right hand of his father. Uh, and to give Stephen, by the way, the grace uh, to keep his eyes upon him whom would not be, he would not be separated from. One of the interesting things when you read, uh, there's a great book called The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. Um, I have a copy of it somewhere in my office. But it goes right along with Fox's Book of Martyrs and other things. It's so interesting because you think, oh, Lord, man, if they took me right now and were going to kill me, I think I'd deny you. God's grace comes when we need it. He doesn't give us the manna for tomorrow, just for today. God's grace will come in those times of, of need, and we need to remember this and just look to Jesus for that. 
Now look at this in verse 20. Because again, Stephen definitely had to have grace for this last part, right? Look at verse 60, I mean. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Fell asleep obviously means he died. Now, in closing, all the while, there was a young man there witnessing everything that was happening. He heard all the words of Stephen. He witnessed and approved of Stephen's being murdered and stoned. He actually held on to the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen so they could have a better throw. This was a man named Saul, a man that God has his eye on and will soon fall in his face before Jesus, professing him to be Lord. That, beloved in Christ, is the glory of grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, that is living. And even today here for all of us, those watching and listening, man, just so blessed that we can learn from this, Lord. Even as we hear the history of Israel, it's not dead words on a page, Lord. They're alive. And they can teach each one of us as we have that heart. And I pray tonight that, again, these words would reverberate in our minds, in our hearts, and we'd remember and bring you glory as we see Stephen, by your grace, Lord, just loving until the end. Loving by your grace, praying for those who killed him even, Lord. Help us to be those by your grace who are loving those who hate us, blessing those who curse us, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.